the Explore team heads to the north coast of California to paddle the less traveled waters of the Lower Klamath. The region is well known for its white water paddling further upriver, while the lower region meanders quietly through the Karuk and Yurok Indian reservations. As it gets closer to the Pacific, there are a few signs of civilization, and large portions of this area are only accessible by water. For centuries, the natives used the river as the primary way to move about the region. When we originally went, you know, fomented the idea of this trip, we decided that we were going to do some sort of adventure along tribal native lands. I was inspired to reread Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness because to me that kind of like was a nice look at two tribes, two cultures blending and trying to find a symbiosis. And so that's what I envisioned this trip to be like, is something deeply sacred, something that was going to allow us to penetrate into another culture and uh, come away with something that was profoundly experiential. This was my second time um, to the Klamath area. The coolest thing for me was to be able to get off the main paved roads, to get off the 101, to kind of get off the thoroughfares and start kind of going in these great smaller roads that go along the Klamath River. Traveling west from Lake Tahoe, the paddlers head toward Orleans to meet up with Craig Tucker, a biologist with the Klamath River Keepers, to learn more about the area and the Klamath restoration efforts. Driving out into this region, you start to uh, wind into the hills and the weather uh, gets decidedly uh, moist and um, snow levels were threatening. We got to Orleans, we met with, uh, with Craig Tucker and you know, it was kind of a quick introduction and I hopped right out on the water, broke the boards out and, and, and got this thing going. It was incredible to meet him and to hear a little bit about his work with the watershed in that area and to realize that even though he didn't know much about paddleboarding, he was really going to be um, a huge asset to us just in terms of educating us to, you know, the issues, the various issues that are going on in that area with the river and um, also knew the river like the back of his hand and spent a lot of time on it. My name is Greg Tucker. Uh, I work for the Karuk Tribe as the Klamath Coordinator, and I'm also on the Board of Directors of Klamath Riverkeeper, which is a non-governmental organization committed to restoring the Klamath and protecting fisheries. Today, dwindling fisheries, overlogging, and poverty begs the question about what has happened over the last hundred years. At the beginning of the century, there was a reported annual catch of over 250,000 fish, but those numbers have dwindled to as low as 28,000 in recent years. There are many factors in the decline of the salmon, mining, and overfishing. However, there has been no greater contributor to the decline of salmon spawning than the seven dams that exist upriver. Not only have the dams removed natural spawning grounds, they cultivate a deadly algae that poisons the migrating salmon. Also, when salmon are stopped at hatcheries, they are prevented from reaching the numerous tributaries where historically they had provided vital nutrients from the ocean to the ecosystem upriver. Klamath is also a culturally diverse region. There are four tribes that live along the river. The Yurok at the mouth, the Kuruk and Hoopa along the middle Klamath, and the Klamath tribes above the dams in Oregon. Had we not had a local guide to impart a sense of like knowledge and history and, and wherewithal, this trip wouldn't have come off as, as incredible as it was. An experienced whitewater kayaker, Craig was able to close the gap for our paddlers, sharing how the river behaves. It's not always about being a stand-up jock. Sometimes kneeling through rough or shallow waters is a fun and safe way to start learning how to get down a river unless you're Lel Tone. Then you just paddle by the boys, laughing from above. The 
reamer got a little spicier. It was a lot of fun. As the day wound on, everyone grew more comfortable with the river and had the chance to relax and enjoy its vibrant wildlife. So after a great first day on the river, we loaded up the van, you know, everybody was kind of drenched rat a little bit, you know, with the drizzle that we'd had. And fortunately, it seemed like the sun ended up coming out and it became a beautiful afternoon when we needed it to, actually. We threw everything in the van and found a beautiful campsite and did a little bit of car camping um, that night. So it was, it was nice to be able to have all of our gear and be able to dry off. And we got a big roaring fire going. Uh, found a great spot and uh, had a great night. We got up early the next morning, got an early start. We had actually a big day ahead of us and uh, we went and met Josh. What an amazing presence um, from the moment I met him and his kids um, and his beautiful wife. Um, they just have carved out a really incredible life for themselves. Had such a great house perched right there on a smaller creek that runs into the Klamath River. Um, I'm a member of the Kaduk tribe, which is, spans from just above Wichipec all the way up uh, to Wairika along the Klamath River. And I'm part Yurok as well, which is from kind of from Wichipec on down to the mouth of the Klamath. Through a connection with the Washoe tribe uh, in the Tahoe Basin, I was given a prayer bundle to deliver to the Karuk tribal elders. And basically what it was was uh, an abalone shell um, filled with river stones from the Truckee River in Tahoe and uh, some desert sage from the eastern Sierra side of the mountains. And so we had an impromptu um, blessing um, in that creek next to Josh's house with his kids. Um, and the dogs and all of us and it was uh you know the weather had improved and the sunlight was filtering through the leaves and the trees and it was lush and green and you know there were salmon moving up the creek and uh it was a pretty magical moment there by the creek next to josh's house After meeting uh, Josh and, and having that small ceremony behind his house there, uh, it, I, got, I got the feeling that uh, Josh wanted to participate a little more than what was the original plan. And he asked if he could uh, paddle the uh, final stretch of the Klamath with, with us over the next two days. Josh had never, never been on a stand-up paddleboard before. Paddlers head to Johnson's to start their journey down the remote lower Klamath. The day's only goal is to make it to the halfway mark of Blue Creek before it gets dark. By Josh's estimation, this will ensure that they make it to the Pacific in two days. You know, the further we drove south, you know, the, the more remote it got. And you really got a sense of, from this point forward, there wasn't going to be a lot of roads coming in. And we were truly on our own. At this point, we were going to be on the river and quite remote, so we kind of had to pare down our equipment quite a bit. Before Western settlers, the Klamath River Basin constituted one of the wealthiest economies of the native world. The river served as the main artery of commerce for the local tribes, and they effectively managed the wealth of natural resources for thousands of years. Passing through the remote part of the river provides a sense of the potential that the Klamath Restoration Project could bring to the wildlife of the region. further down we got, the more wildlife we saw. That was uh, an incredible experience. We actually saw a number of bear that day, 
and actually got very close to a bear, Ronnie actually was able to be a little more river right and the bear couldn't smell us coming and we were able to get really, really close before he took flight and went running up the hillside. But it was a pretty cool experience to see all of this wildlife, um, you know, in its natural and beautiful habitat. But that, that day was, was a lot of fun and it was a lot of sightseeing, just moving at the pace of the river, moving at the pace of life in the Klamath Valley. I think the, one of the most remarkable things about this trip was to be traveling through a different ecosystem. Um, you know, and as we got further downstream, you could just see the trees change. You know, you started seeing these huge redwoods from these smaller pines. And you really got the sense of, wow, we're moving into a slightly different climate closer to the ocean. As we're meandering down the waterway, it was, it was so easy to get completely enraptured by the environment and not realize like the logistics of like, hey, we need to eat and we need to have a place to sleep tonight. As we start, try to scout out areas, uh, you know, my first thought was let's not find an area that bears like to go because <laughs> uh, we had been seeing them all along and um, we did find a really nice soft mound of, of sand that uh, looked like it could, you know, basically handle our tents and uh, have a nice little cushy sleeping bed for ourselves. and. Uh, it was just it happened at the right time because any any longer would have been you know getting quite dark and uh, we still had to make camp, build a fire, and we were very hungry by that point. Just under the cover of darkness, we were get, able to get everything set up. Uh, found an awesome spot to spend the night, and uh, Josh ended up. Uh, cooking us an amazing salmon feast that night. Being a vegan, I don't, I don't eat fish ever, and it was one of those things where out of deep respect, I'm like, I'm gonna eat salmon. If there's any time in my life I need to eat salmon, it's right here, you know? So we woke up the next morning and realized that the weather had turned definitely for the worst. It had rained pretty incessantly all night long. Packing up all our camping gear and everything was a little arduous and soggy. And uh, realized we had a good 12, 15 miles to go. The Northwest served up its signature weather, justifying the coastal rainforests that surround the watershed. It will be a long haul to the Pacific through ever-slowing waters and persistent rain. So, you know, this day on the river was to be a long one, and to be quite honest, we didn't quite know how much time it would take. It became very apparent that as we move down river, with all of these tributaries of water coming in from both sides, that the river was getting broader, it was starting to move a lot slower, and so we realized, wow, this, this might end up being a very long day. But at the same time, it was a magical experience because all the wildlife was, was out there doing their thing, the bears, the, the bald eagles, At the confluence of Klamath and Blue Creek, um, I don't know, for me it was kind of an event. Coming down the river and starting to see the mixture of the two waters is pretty obvious why they call it Blue Creek. The water, the stones, everything had changed blue. I, I was, you know, becoming mesmerized by this, the movement of this water. And for me, it was a very special event. The Hawaiians always look at the conjunction of two bodies of water, two rivers, Wailua, um, as, as a, a sacred space. 
and I, I know the Native Americans also look at it as a power spot. It's two separate entities coming together and blending, you know, harmonically. And so I, I felt it. It, it. it was a really incredibly moving experience being in that space. So after we passed Blue Creek and got back on our boards after lunch, you know, we did start seeing some boat traffic. We did start realizing that we were getting closer to the other end and potentially closer to the ocean. Coming further down the Klamath, uh, the kind of reality wake-up call is the 10, Highway 101 crossing over the river and paddling under it. That was the you're back in reality wake-up call. Um, from there you're really close to the ocean and the ocean influence just comes right at you. The, the smell of the salt water hits your nostrils after you know being on fresh water for all this time. You start seeing more and more seals and the pelicans are coming around. We actually encountered this big flock of uh, river fowl um, that we ended up kind of paddling behind and it was incredible. They would just let us get just close enough and then they would all take flight. And it was like we had this escort of birds for the last half mile. Well, you know, like, like all adventures, they, they unfortunately always have a destination. Um, as an ocean kid, I, I, could, I could smell it and taste it before I, I could see it. So I knew we were getting to our journey's end, which was unfortunate for me because on these sort of expeditions, I kind of like them to be open-ended and never-ending. If I could do this every day for the rest of my life, I'd do it. So as we came around the last bend, uh, we were able to see on the horizon line just this giant um, beach, uh, this kind of big sandbar that separated the river from the Pacific Ocean. And you know, you just got this sense, you knew that it was raging and every once in a while you'd be able to see the waves breaking over the top of that beach and then disappear as they broke on the shore. You could hear the pounding and you could hear the power of the ocean. It definitely was this magnetic pull that just pulled us right to the, right to the beach. It was such a remarkable thing to be back on the earth and to run up over this beach and down the other side to behold these crashing waves on the Pacific and you know, Northern California coast in the fall at that time of year has some incredible surf and uh, we got to see uh, the ocean in all of her fury. It was just a, um, a jaw-dropping moment where we all just stood on the beach and feeling the energy. After we packed up all of our gear off the beach um, and had a beautiful moment down there on the ocean with it crashing at our toes, we drove up to the scenic overlook uh, where we could see the river mouth as it emptied out into the Pacific. And it was a really powerful moment for me. Um, it was a great way to end our trip. Uh, Josh brought out some angelica root um, that we burned and and it was really an important time for me to reflect on not only the physical journey itself down the Klamath, but uh, the emotional journey that we all make when we encounter powerful experiences like the one we just had. I, I really could never understand the anti-dam concept because I never had been around it, but now I get it. The dams pose uh, other other threats as well. The soil doesn't become as healthy because the salmon are migrating to that area, and of course the the flow of the river is you know, dramatically decreased uh, from what it was before the dams. We can continue to learn to respect the natural process and to be a humble part of this environment that we live in instead of calling all the shots. It's not always about thrill-seeking or facing life-threatening extremes. 
In moments of solitude, we can find beauty and balance through a journey taken while almost standing still. I declare a holiday For everyone in love Though I admit I've been wrong About all of this before 